In the vast tapestry of human history, few cities have seen as much as Jerusalem. Its ancient walls have been the silent observers of countless tales of love, faith, and conflict. Yet, among these myriad stories, one chapter stands out, echoing through the ages with its sheer intensity and impact. Dive with us into the dramatic tale of the siege of Jerusalem. It's a time when mighty empires collided, when the streets ran with the determination of defenders and the might of invaders. Discover a city at the brink, its people's resilience, the heart-wrenching tragedies they faced, and the profound transformation that followed. Join us as we peel back the layers of time to reveal a story that still resonates today. During the era of the Second Temple, Jerusalem stood as the heartbeat of Jewish religious and national identity, even for those Jews living far away in the diaspora. The significance of the Second Temple was immense, drawing possibly hundreds of thousands of pilgrims during the three pilgrimage festivals. At the zenith of the late Second Temple period, the city sprawled over two square kilometers, housing an impressive population of around 200,000. The renowned Pliny the Elder, in his work Natural History, hailed Jerusalem as the crown jewel of the East, unmatched in its fame. The architectural layout of early Roman Jerusalem was divided into two main areas. The primary precinct, nestled within the boundaries of the First Wall, included the city of David and the Upper City. This area was densely populated, with the exception of its more affluent sections. Adjacent to this was the suburb or Bethesda, situated to the north. This region, less populated, was enclosed within the Herodian Second Wall, which remained intact. Interestingly, this suburb was also enveloped by the newer Third Wall, a project initiated by King Agrippa I. Historian Josephus provides an intriguing insight into Agrippa's ambitions for this Third Wall. The king envisioned a formidable barrier, at least five meters in thickness, designed to thwart any contemporary siege machinery. Yet, Agrippa's grand plans were halted at the foundational stage. His apprehension stemmed from a concern that Emperor Claudius might perceive such a robust fortification as a precursor to political upheaval or rebellion. The wall's completion was eventually realized, albeit in a more hurried and less fortified manner, when the first Jewish-Roman war loomed, necessitating enhanced defenses for Jerusalem. This hastily constructed third wall was punctuated with nine imposing towers. The First Jewish-Roman War, often referred to as the Great Jewish Revolt, ignited when Prefect Jesius Florus took office and audaciously demanded funds from the temple. Nero, the Roman emperor, tasked Vespasian, a skilled yet understated general, with quelling this uprising in Judea. Vespasian made his move in early 68 CE, arriving at Ptolemy and swiftly initiating military campaigns in the Galilee. By July 69, the entirety of Judea, with the exception of Jerusalem, had been subdued. The city, now a refuge for rebel leaders from across the nation, found itself under the weight of a Roman siege. Jerusalem, with its robust fortifications, could have potentially withstood the siege for an extended period. However, its defenses were compromised from within due to a fierce civil war that erupted between the moderates and the zealots. In a twist of fate, Vespasian left Judea for Rome in the summer of 69 CE, and by December, he ascended to the throne as emperor. This left the responsibility of commanding the Roman legions and continuing the siege in the capable hands of his son, Titus. In the second year of Vespasian's reign, as noted by historian Josephus, which aligns with the year 70 CE, Titus initiated the siege of Jerusalem. The siege commenced just days before the Passover, with the city surrounded by three Roman legions to the west and a fourth stationed on the Mount of Olives to the east. At this time, Jerusalem was bustling with people who had arrived to observe the Passover. The Roman forces began their assault from the west, targeting the third wall near the Jaffa Gate. By May, this wall was breached, and shortly after, the second wall fell, leaving the Jewish defenders with only the temple and parts of the upper and lower city. Inside the city, divisions among the Jewish defenders were evident. Zealot leaders, Simon bar Giora and John of Giscola, pointed fingers at the moderate leaders for the revolt's failures. Tensions escalated when John's faction assassinated Eliezer ben Simon, another faction leader. The zealots were determined to keep the city from Roman hands, even if it meant eliminating their own people. 
yet there were voices advocating for peace. Yohanan ben Zakkai, for instance, sought negotiations with the Romans. He was smuggled out of the city in a coffin to discuss terms with Vespasian. However, the zealot's reign of terror within the city overshadowed such efforts. Josephus recounts the horrors inflicted upon the city's inhabitants by their own leaders, including the burning of essential food supplies. The animosity between John of Giscola and Simon Bar Giora was momentarily set aside when Roman siege engineers began constructing ramparts. In response, Titus erected a wall around the city to effectively starve its inhabitants. The Romans then launched a covert attack on the fortress of Antonia. Despite initial successes in repelling the Romans, the zealots' infighting and lack of leadership undermined their defense. In a desperate move, they even destroyed the city's food stocks either to invoke divine intervention or to force the defenders into a desperate stand against the Romans. Josephus narrates that when the Romans approached Antonia, they attempted to dismantle its protective wall. Though they removed only a few stones, the wall collapsed overnight. The Romans then began their assault on the temple. Despite Titus's intention to preserve the temple, a Roman soldier inadvertently set it ablaze. The temple, a magnificent structure renovated by Herod the Great, was destroyed in August 70 CE. Josephus paints a grim picture of the scene, describing heaps of corpses around the altar and rivers of blood flowing down the sanctuary steps. While Josephus's account portrays Titus as not wanting the temple's destruction, some believe this portrayal was to gain favor with the ruling Flavian dynasty. The Roman forces swiftly subdued any remaining Jewish resistance. Some Jews managed to escape through hidden passages, while others mounted a last stand in the upper city. By September 8th, the entire city was under Roman control, and the Romans relentlessly pursued any escapees. Josephus portrays Titus as a tempered leader, suggesting that he intended to preserve the temple, which had stood for half a millennium. It was the Jews, according to Josephus, who first introduced fire near the temple's northwest approach, attempting to halt the Roman advance. Only in response did the Romans set an adjacent apartment ablaze, a fire that the Jews inadvertently exacerbated. Having played the role of a mediator for the Romans and witnessing the siege's climax and aftermath, Josephus offers a first-hand account when the Roman forces found no more individuals to kill or plunder, having left no stone unturned in their fury, Titus decreed the city and temple's complete demolition. However, he ordered the preservation of the most eminent towers, Phasilus, Hippicus, and Miriam, as well as a portion of the wall on the city's west side. This preservation served dual purposes, to provide a camp for the Roman garrison and to stand as a testament to the grandeur and fortifications of the city that Roman valor had conquered. Yet, the rest of Jerusalem's walls were so meticulously raised to their foundations that nothing remained to suggest the city had ever been inhabited. Such was the fate of Jerusalem, a city of immense splendor and renown, brought to ruin by the zeal of its radical factions. Josephus continues with a poignant reflection on the city's transformation. The site was heart-wrenching. Areas once graced with trees and lush gardens now lay barren, their trees filled. Any foreigner who had once admired Dudea and the city's picturesque outskirts, now witnessing its desolation, would be moved to deep sorrow. The scars of war had obliterated all traces of its former beauty. Indeed, anyone familiar with the city's former glory, if they were to suddenly return, would scarcely recognize it. Even standing within its boundaries, they would question if this was the Jerusalem they once knew. Over time, archaeological discoveries have lent credence to Josephus's account of Jerusalem's devastation. Scholars, examining the remnants of the city's past, have largely concurred with his historical descriptions. Ronnie Reich has noted that while evidence directly related to the temple's destruction is limited, significant remains from the Temple Mount walls, the upper city, the western part of the city, and the Tyropean Valley have been uncovered. He emphasizes that the archaeological findings often align with Josephus's narrative, underscoring the historian's credibility. In the latter half of the 20th century, under the guidance of Naman Avigad, a team unearthed signs of an intense fire that had ravaged the residential structures of the upper city. This inferno obliterated all organic materials. 
In structures with beamed ceilings, the fire's intensity caused the upper sections to collapse, burying everything beneath layers of stone and debris. Some buildings bore partial evidence of this destruction, while others were entirely consumed. In various sites, calcium oxides were identified, suggesting that the fire was so intense it altered the very composition of the limestone. One notable site, the burnt house in the Herodian Quarter, bears the scars of this catastrophic event. The fire's aftermath was evident even in everyday household items. Limestone containers showed signs of ash staining or were completely calcified due to the intense heat. Glass items, subjected to the fire's fury, warped and deformed to the point of being irreparable. However, pottery and basalt items remained largely intact. The remnants of the fires, including ash and charred wood, accumulated to an average height of about a meter, while the fallen rocks piled up to heights of two meters or more. The city's infrastructure also bore the brunt of the destruction. The extensive urban drainage system and the pool of Siloam in the lower city became clogged with silt and ceased to function. The city walls, once a symbol of its might, lay in ruins in many areas. Evidence of the temple's destruction was found along the Herodian Street adjacent to the western wall. Massive stones, once part of the temple mount's walls, lay scattered across the area. Among these remnants was the Trumpeting Place inscription, a significant Hebrew inscription believed to have been cast down by Roman soldiers during the temple's destruction. Josephus's account of the siege's aftermath paints a grim picture. He claims that during the siege, a staggering 1.1 million individuals perished, with the majority being Jewish. This immense death toll, according to him, was exacerbated due to the influx of people into Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. Post-siege, after the Romans had dispatched the armed and elderly, Josephus states that 97,000 individuals were taken as slaves. Many were sold into bondage, but out of the original inhabitants of Jerusalem, 40,000 survivors were granted their freedom by the emperor, allowing them to settle wherever they wished. Josephus also mentions that throughout the siege, there were significant desertions from the city. Tacitus, another historian from the Roman era, offers a different perspective. He estimates that the besieged population, encompassing all ages and both genders, totaled around 600,000. He notes that there were weapons available for all capable of wielding them, and the number of those ready to engage in combat was surprisingly high given the overall population. Both men and women displayed unwavering resolve, with many fearing the prospect of life in a new home more than death itself. However, Josephus's death toll figures have been met with skepticism. Seth Schwartz, for instance, finds the numbers implausible. He estimates that the entire population of Palestine during that period was around a million, with Jews making up about half of this number. Moreover, Schwartz points out that even after the war, significant Jewish populations remained in the region, including in the heavily affected area of Judea. While he questions the death toll, Schwartz considers the figure of 97,000 captives to be more credible. It's also worth noting that the revolt didn't deter pilgrims from journeying to Jerusalem. Many of these pilgrims found themselves trapped in the city during the siege and subsequently lost their lives. The repercussions of the siege extended beyond Jerusalem. Many inhabitants of neighboring regions were either displaced from their lands or subjected to enslavement. Upon their triumphant return to Rome, Titus and his legions celebrated their victory over Jerusalem in grand fashion. Central to this celebration was the display of the menorah and the table of the bread of God's presence, sacred artifacts from the temple. Until this moment, these revered items had been exclusively viewed by the temple's high priest. Their public display in Rome was a profound symbol of Roman dominance over Judea. This significant event was immortalized in the iconic Arch of Titus. The celebrations also saw around 700 Judean captives paraded through Rome's streets in chains. Among these prisoners were notable leaders Simon Bar Giora and John of Giscola. Simon Bar Giora met a grim fate. After being deemed a rebel and traitor, he was executed by being hurled from the Tarpeian Rock at the Temple of Jupiter. In contrast, John of Giscola received a life sentence, condemned to spend the remainder of his days in captivity. 
After Jerusalem's devastating fall and the subsequent obliteration of its city and sacred temple, a handful of Judean fortresses still stood defiant against the Roman onslaught. These strongholds, namely Herodium, Machiris, and Masada, became the last bastions of Judean resistance. Within the subsequent two years, the Romans managed to conquer both Herodium and Machiris. However, Masada remained unyielding. Masada, perched atop a plateau and fortified with impressive defenses, became the final stand for the Judean rebels. But in 73 CE, the Romans, showcasing their military prowess, managed to penetrate Masada's walls. Yet, what they found inside was not a fierce battle but a haunting scene. According to Josephus, the Jewish defenders, choosing death over capture, had committed mass suicide, leaving the Romans to capture a silent fortress. This somber event marked the conclusion of the First Jewish-Roman War. Sixty years after the First Jewish-Roman War's conclusion, tensions in Judea reignited, culminating in the Bar Kokhba Revolt in 132 CE. Two significant Roman actions are believed to have been the primary triggers for this uprising, the establishment of a Roman colony named Aelia Capitolina atop the ruins of Jerusalem and the construction of a temple dedicated to Jupiter on the Temple Mount. Backed by the Sanhedrin, Simon Bar Kosiba, who later came to be known as Bar Kokhba, led the revolt and managed to establish a short-lived independent state. However, by 135 CE, the Romans had quashed this rebellion. The aftermath of the Bar Kokhba revolt was even more devastating than the First Jewish-Roman War. The Judean communities faced such extensive depopulation that some scholars have characterized the Roman response as genocidal in nature. Despite this severe blow to the Judean communities, Jewish life persisted robustly in other regions of Palestine. Communities flourished in areas like Galilee, Golan, the Bet Sheen Valley, and the eastern, southern, and western fringes of Judea. In a symbolic move to erase the memory of the Jewish state, Emperor Hadrian renamed Judea to Syria Palestina. This renaming was not just a political maneuver, but also an attempt to diminish the Jewish connection to the land. The Flavian dynasty, in a grand display of their victory over Jerusalem, erected two monumental triumphal arches. The more renowned of these is the Arch of Titus, constructed around 82 CE by Emperor Domitian on Rome's Via Sacra. This arch, which still stands today, commemorates the siege and subsequent fall of Jerusalem. Its bar-relief vividly illustrates Roman soldiers in a victory procession, bearing spoils from the temple, most notably the menorah. Another arch of Titus, commissioned by the Senate in 82 CE, was situated at the Circus Maximus's southeast entrance. This arch, lesser known than its counterpart, has mostly vanished, with only a few remnants still in existence. In 75 CE, under Emperor Vespasian's reign, the Temple of Peace, or the Forum of Vespasian, was erected in Rome. This edifice, a celebration of the Jerusalem conquest, is believed to have housed the menorah from Herod's temple. Another iconic structure, the Colosseum or the Flavian Amphitheater, constructed between 70 and 82 CE in Rome, is thought to have been funded, at least in part, by the treasures seized from the Jews. Supporting this belief, archaeological excavations have unearthed a block of travertine with dowel holes, suggesting that the wealth amassed from the Jewish wars contributed to the amphitheater's construction. The Flavians also minted the Dudia Capta coins, a series of commemorative currency. Vespasian introduced these coins to mark the capture of Dudia and the temple's destruction, an act carried out by his son, Titus. In Jewish tradition, the sorrow of the first and second temple's destruction is remembered on Tisha B'Av, an annual fast day. Intriguingly, Jewish tradition holds that both temples were destroyed on the same date in the Hebrew calendar. The catastrophic destruction of the temple and Jerusalem had profound spiritual and societal implications for the Jewish community. The Jewish Amorim, scholars who interpreted the oral law, saw this devastation as divine retribution for the baseless hatred that had infected Jewish society of that era. In the wake of such immense loss, many Jews grappled with despair. Some are believed to have abandoned their Jewish faith, turning instead to various forms of paganism. Concurrently, a significant number found solace in the burgeoning Christian sect that was emerging within Judaism. 
This tumultuous period also marked a pivotal moment in the divergence of Christianity from its Jewish origins. Many Christians sought to distance themselves from mainstream Judaism. This distancing is evident in the Gospels, which often depict Jesus as being critical of the temple. Furthermore, the Gospels suggest that the temple's destruction was a divine punishment for the Jewish rejection of Jesus. Yet, despite its physical destruction, Jerusalem never faded from the Jewish consciousness. It continued to hold a revered place in Jewish life and culture, symbolizing hope, the aspiration for return, and the dream of national rejuvenation. The concept of a third temple, which would be rebuilt in Jerusalem, remains a fundamental tenet of Orthodox Judaism to this day. Thank you for watching this episode of History Uncovered. We delve deep into the annals of history to bring the story of Jerusalem's fall and its lasting impact on the world. Your support means a lot to us. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell for notifications, ensuring you never miss an episode. Join us again as we continue to uncover the fascinating tales of our shared past.